for this very rigorous uh, study of musical form uh, and method and the historical conditions under which they had arisen. Uh, and this led him to the uh, inescapable conclusion that improvisation itself was the only approach to music that could deal with complex political realities uh, in contemporary society. Um, he says that um, you know, these, these two frameworks are a rejection uh, of existing musical theory. They're a severance. Uh, but they're not a rejection of theory in its entirety because the new stuff, it has to have something uh, to underpin it. Um, in 1981, uh, he writes, on a level plane, we proceed single-mindedly towards the core and fut fut futurity of improvised music, uh, divorced from imbecilic daily life and parochial theorizing. It is improvisation alone that transcends genre uh, and academicism to become music as raw, independent existence, the most unique living organism within a yet to be known, yet to be, within a yet to be unknown. Um, as well as being a means to short circuit his own leanings towards a stoic and arid uh, academicism, uh, improvisation seems to have been a primal generative force uh, strong enough uh, for Takenagi to recover an authentic form of existence, which he refers to as raw and independent here. Uh, later, he uses, uh, in other places, he uses the metaphors of blood uh, and physicality uh, to refer to this kind of existence. Um, I just want to move very briefly uh, at the end to say something about the, the application uh, of this. Uh, you know, his theorizing, you know, there's a, that was a very long quotation I gave you. Uh, I could have given you a, a lot more because he, he does write a lot about this, this stuff. Um, and a lot of his writing about it, it is very dense. Um, and it seems to ascend simultaneously uh, towards the mythic uh, and the bodily. Um, but he also attempts to make them engage with the, with the social and the political uh, as well. Um, so I'd like to say a couple of things just very briefly at the end about the appearance by his group, uh, New Direction uh, for the Arts, uh, at this Genyasai uh, festival in Sanrizuka uh, on August 14th, 1971. Um, Sanrizuka, I'm sure most of you here, I don't need to explain what's going on there too much, but this is this uh, area to the east of Tokyo whose land had been earmarked for the construction of a new international airport, uh, the airport that's now called Narita. Uh, there's an alliance which develops between local farmers uh, and leftist uh, student groups uh, who attempt to resist the lack of due process uh, in the decision to site the airport here. Um, they attempt to uh, combat the inadequate public consultation uh, and the failure of local government to represent local interests. Um, I'm sure, as I say, many of you are familiar with the, the background and, and the narrative about this particular confrontation, which is uh, very violent. It does involve uh, several deaths. Uh, so I'm not really going to say much more uh, about that, other than that the lead-up to this particular festival was marked by anger and desperation. Um, and through the summer of 1971 and into the autumn, um, as forced expropriations of land uh, begin, these clashes become increasingly uh, violent. Uh, so this is the, the context then in which this particular festival, this Genyasai uh, festival, takes place. Um, the bill reflects uh, the tastes of the student uh, side of this uh, resistance movement um, with leading free jazz musicians from the capital, Takianagi, Abekaura, uh, Takagi Mototero, uh, appearing alongside some uh, kind of punk folk groups, uh, heavy, heavy electric blues bands, uh, etc. Um, Takianagi, uh, his group New Direction for the Arts, uh, tops the bill on the opening day. Uh, and they play a very aggressive, uncompromising mass projection uh, set, the kind of thing that I just played for you. Um, alongside drummer uh, Yamazaki Hiroshi uh, and saxophonist uh, Mori Kenji, uh, Takianagi soloed hard and continuously for 40 minutes. Um, this was performance as precisely calibrated metaphor. Uh, three musicians responding to the demands of the moment with instinctive force and fury, uh, untethered uh, from theory, leaderless yet not rudderless. Uh, the direction part of the group's name is no accident, obviously. Um, the piece uh, was entitled La Grima, uh, or Tears, um, and the fusion between the palpable anger of the performance and the hopeless sadness of the title were perfectly apt for the situation at hand. Uh, this was a fight that the state was always going to win. Uh, yet by all accounts, uh, the set went down like a fart at a funeral. 
Uh, the band were showered with catcalls and debris throughout uh, and by chance of go home when the music finally came to an end. Um, however, uh, later that year, Takianagi, uh, in the year-end issue of Japan's leading jazz magazine, Swing Journal, looks back uh, at his appearance at the festival. Uh, and he says, he's surprisingly upbeat uh, about what had happened. Uh, he says at the Genya Festival uh, at Tenjin no Mine in San Rizuka, uh, New Directions brought a solid political consciousness to our performance, and we succeeded in an authentic and realistic depiction of the situation. Kakujitsu ni jokyo, shajitsu shieta, is what he says in Japanese. Uh, but journalism reve revealed its superficiality in its inability to penetrate the core of the music. Uh, I don't know much about anyone else, but we at last we at least left uh, a competent record behind us. Um, note that his uh, immediate reaction is not to dismiss the audience's reaction uh, to the music. Rather, he stresses that the group succeeded in providing an appropriate musical reaction to a political situation. Um, Kitazato Yoshiyuki has commented that this statement seems rooted less in a sense of political sympathy for the communities uh, than in the vividness of his own experience, Takianagi's own experiences as an evacuee to rural villages during the war uh, and the awareness of the class dynamics at work within those communities. Um, forging a musical bridge between conservative farmers standing on the, brin on the brink of wrenching loss and leftist urban students was always going to be a tough call. Um, four years later, 1975, uh, in a round table discussion for Ongaku magazine, Takianagi reflects once more on what had happened uh, at the festival. Uh, and he says, the farmer's lifeblood, uh, he uses the word inochi, so essentially the land is what he's talking about, uh, was going to be forcibly seized. This was not something that can be understood in any commonplace way. Try to imagine yourself in that position. You'll see that your choices have already been decided for you. Setting aside the success of the music I played on the day, the whole festival itself was a wretched and miserable thing. It's not right to talk about those farmers' lifestyles or how there was some fundamental difference in sensibility between us and them. I was fully aware of both of those things. In that situation, there was no way that one individual's abstract will in the form of music was going to get across. My only intent was to drive a wedge of malevolence. Oops. Uh, he uses uh, this term here, zō uh, no kusabi, uh, a wedge of malevolence uh, into the land itself. I couldn't have cared less if anyone understood objectively what we were doing, because the earth would understand. The earth has a face and feelings no different from an audi ordinary audience. In fact, it far exceeds any educated human being, make it the making it the purest kind of listener. It's a fascinating statement. Um, on the one hand, yes, you can read it as stubborn and solipsistic and self-justifying, perhaps. Uh, yet in conjunction with his statement in 1971, I think there are a couple of points that guide us towards an understanding of just what he intended with that performance at the festival. Uh, the first is the group was concerned above all with representing the reality of the situation, a complex emotional reality in which far more was at stake than simple communication and sympathy. He, underli he underlines that he understood that. Given what was at stake, communication was in fact never going to be possible at the festival. If communication is not possible, then what are you left with? The representation of the crushing reality of state power? The shallow response of leftist organizers of the festival who had imagined some simple and rose-tinted temporary communion between city and country? Neither is going to accomplish very much. His statement makes it clear that the performance was not even directed at the human beings present. Um, the critic I mentioned earlier, Kitazata Yoshiyuki, uh, has argued that this is almost a, a religious uh, act uh, directed uh, at the earth deities uh, of the land around San Rizuka. Um, it's a union of anger, sorrow, and malevolence that can be placed nowhere effective. All it can do is find expression and channeling. The forcible land uh, seizures at Narita, the eviction of farmers from land that had been in families for generations, the destruction of communities, none of this can be prevented, not least by any artistic action. All that can be done is an attempt to mark the land itself, to soak it with the combined force of emotions and the volume of the performances, 
to bury something there that cannot be drawn out, even by the coming roar of jet engines. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Uh, and next we have uh, uh, Yoshiko Shimada uh, here from Tokyo, uh, an artist, uh, curator, and, and scholar, uh, uh, having uh, recently completed a, a PhD at uh, Kingston University uh, this year. Um, so uh, uh, someone who's been the, uh, the subject of some academic in investigations now moves over onto our side as a fellow perpetrator. Um, uh, and uh, uh, Yoshiko has uh, uh, recently uh, undergone a, a number of uh, uh, curatorial and investigative projects that have uh, uh, looked into uh, several forms of, of transnational and, and also uh, difficult to border male art and, and, and art education investigations, and I've been uh, privileged enough to take part in, in some of these. But we please welcome Yoshiko Shimada. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for introduction. And I uh, would like to thank Takasaki Center for inviting me. It's very much, uh, I'm very honored to be here. Uh, today, my, the subject of my talk paper is Yoshi, um, Nakajima Yoshio. Nakajima Yoshio is a pioneer of happenings in Japan and Northern Europe. He's also a painter, but he's now largely forgotten in Japan. This is partly because he left Japan in 1964 and didn't return except for a solo exhibition in 1972. And also because uh, he remained in Scandinavia, which some would call a peripheral area of Europe. Nevertheless, a brief look at Nakajima's activities in this peripheral, but in some respect cutting edge Northern European context may lead us to reconsider the notion of unidirectional influence in mid 20th century art from the West to Asia. And to reevaluate this, the significance of anti art in Japan in the 1960s within the global counterculture movement. Oops. Sorry, it just moved too much. Let's go back. But okay, in late 19th and 20th century Japanese art, there have been many artists who went to the West. In the Meiji period, it was to study yoga or Western painting in France. Artists were sent by the government and on their return, they became professors at the National Academy of Art. This pilgrimage to Paris continued into the Taisho and early Showa eras. After the Second World War, the favored destination was New York, considered to be the center of the art world. The artists who managed to go abroad were mostly from well-to-do families or recipients of scholarships. Nakajima Yoshio was an exception. Nakajima was born in Saitama in 1940. He left home at the age of 15, aspiring to become an artist like Van Gogh. In 1957, Nakajima started his street actions, calling himself a moving object. Yoshida Yoshie, an art critic, wrote about his actions. Quote, he understood alternative communication intuitively and physically. His action was involuntary, convulsive, and manic, coming from his inner consciousness. His action at Ochanomizu Station in Tokyo stopped the train service, and he was arrested. 
It was a time when there were no such terms as performance art or happening in Japan yet. So this is the inside of the commuter train in 1957 or 58. In the early 1960s, the Yomiuri and the independent exhibition, or Yomiuri Anpan, saw the emergence of anti-art. A rough, unruly, and sometimes destructive style championed by neo-Dadaism organizers, Kudo Tetsumi, Kyushu Ha, and others. The emergence of these rebellious young artist groups is often explained by the influence of American neo-Dada movement and French L'Enformel or informal, the informal, with their new methodologies of action painting, installation, and performance. However, art critic Takiguchi Shuzo argues that this eruption of wild style in Japan should not, quote, necessarily be, be connected to L'Enformel paintings. Rather, the expressive energy found an outlet in direct action. L'Enformel was just a trigger. The implication of Takiguchi's argument is that the anti-art would have happened in Japan with or without the influence of L'Enformel. The art, anti-artist, anti-art artist appetite for destroying the established aesthetic and art world hierarchy had the marked similarity to the anarchic and destructive force of the Japanese student organization Bunto in the anti ampo struggle in 1960. In 1958, Nakajima formed a group called Unbeat with his friends in Shohei High School. It was the first artistic group in Japan that solely focused on performance in public spaces. They organized Neo Dada Art Festival in 1960. Here, the piled up junk art consisted of debris from anti-ampo demonstrations that they had retrieved from the streets of Tokyo. In 1962, they staged outdoor actions in Kyoto and Osaka. Ambit named their actions Dam Act. According to Nakajima, it meant stopping the flow, reflecting their refusal to go along with the course of events of the post ampo period. And here again, they got arrested. In 1963, Ambit performed a Dam Act at the last Yomiuri Dependent Exhibition without permission. Nakajima his face painted white, wearing a white shirt with a Dada manifesto, lurked around the Tokyo Metropolitan Museum of Art. He scuffled with art critic Yoshida Yoshie and was arrested again by the police on the front steps of the museum. This incident and other radical works brought an end to the Yomiuri Independent Exhibition. By 1964, restrictions of fo on foreign travel were lifted, and Nakajima decided to go, go abroad on the recommendation of Daniel van Golden, a Dutch artist who had the residency in Japan. Here, the, that right-hand side, he, that's Daniel van Golden. He's now quite famous artist in Holland. Nakajima initially sailed to Hong Kong, then hitchhiked his way to Europe. As he came from an ordinary farming family in Saitama, support from them was out of the question, and he had no other financial support. When his money ran out, he sang and performed on the street in exchange for food and money. After his arrival in the Netherlands, he enrolled at the Royal Academy of Art in Rotterdam, but soon got involved in the performance art scene that came to be known as Plovo, the Plovo movement. Plovo is, a, is a, a meant provocation. He became a close, close friend of Robert Jasper Grootveld, a leading figure of the Plovo movement. Nakajima, Grootveld, and Simon Finkenug started Magic Center at K Tempo in Amsterdam and staged happenings there every weekend. 
the Dutch global movement was a playful political and artistic movement comparable in some ways to the Situationist International. They used artistic strategies during their urban actions and tried to create social change through theatrical street happenings and other symbolic means. Provo lasted only from 1965 to 67, but it inspired the counterculture and green movements of the late 1960s and 70s. As the Provo movement became more overtly political, police intervention became more frequent. Nakajima faced 13 charges of performing without a permit and was ordered to leave the Netherlands. This created a stir there and in neighboring countries. Nakajima then moved to Belgium in, uh, in the early summer of 1965. His friends in Amsterdam had told of Nakajima's arrival in Belgium and he found a group of artists waiting for him at the cafe in Antwerp. Nakajima recalled that as Belgium was more conservative at the time, and not many artists were practicing street actions and happenings, he was welcomed there as a pioneer. Panamarenko, uh, he's a the quite fa very famous Belgian performance artist, later said that he started his performances only after meeting Nakajima. Here is that the right hand side is Panamalenko and on the, the ground is Nakajima. In Antwerp, Nakajima, Panamalenko, Hugo Heilman, and Walt Ferkerman launched Happening News and organized experimental action events every Saturday at Green Park in Antwerp. Nakajima enrolled at the Lawyer Academy in Antwerp in September 1965 but soon after was again ordered to leave the country for performing without permit. He was performing frequently with Grootveld and Thomas, Jas Thomas Jaspers, both central figures in, the, in Provo in Netherlands, and the Belgian authorities perhaps feared their influence. After leaving Belgium, Nakajima hitchhiked to Germany and then to Denmark. Earlier in Amsterdam, he had met Asga Jong, a cobra artist and one of the founders of the Situationist International, and was introduced to his brother, Jorgen Nash. Jong advised Nakajima to go to Sweden. He followed Jong's advice and was accepted into the Farland Royal Academy of, of Art in Göteborg. He was the first Asian student there and was provided with a studio, apartment, and stipendium. The academy expected Nakajima to bring fresh air into the academy by introducing fluxes like new artistic practices. The Scandinavian Situationist movement, known as Bauhaus Situationist, was organized by Asuka Jung. In 1957, Jung and Guy de Waugh had formed the Situationist International. But by 1960, this code between the Nordic and the French Situationist became clear, and Jung and Nash formed Bauhaus Situationist in Sweden. In 1961, Jung left the Situationist International, and in 1962, Nash was expelled from it for factional activities. The antagonism between Scandinavian and French situationists was largely caused by the difference in their attitude towards art and politics. Jung and Nash inherited Cobra's celebratory and expressionistic attitude to art and Huizinger's notion of homo rudens. The Bauhaus situationists were based in a rural setting reflecting the Nordic utopian view of nature, whereas the French Situationist movement was urban and political, seeking actual revolution. Bauhaus Situationist playfulness, humor, and naturalism all resonated with Nakajima, and he became closely connected to Bauhaus Situationist in 1968 and was warmly welcomed by Nash and 
Jens Jorgen Thorsen at the, their headquarter in Drakabiget in southern Sweden. The left is uh, um, Jorgen Nash and right is Thorsen. In 1968, Bauhaus stationists rented the bus to storm the Venice Biennale and Castel Documenta via Paris. Nakajima joined them and performed in front of the Modern Art Museum in Paris during the May uprising. The students in Venice demanded the closure of Biennale, decrying its inherent nationalism and commercialism. And the Swedish commissioner and the artist boycotted the Biennale. The Bauhaus stationists took over the emptied Swedish pavilion and turned it into revolutionary pavilion. And then later, in 1972, the Bauhaus stationist again intervened in the Castle Documenta and organized an alternative documenta and built a junk sculpture at the front entrance of the museum. And also Nakajima was there. <laughs> and in 1973, Nakajima and his friends started an art center in a remote village called Ubeboda in southern Sweden. In 1974, Nakajima planned 100-day symposium on stone with the support of